If you look at the flowering plants, which are also called angiosperms, then the flower represents the sexual part of that plant. On the other hand, if you look at non-flowering plants, which are also called the gymnosperms, then these cones, they represent their sexual parts. But you know what? Flowers are beautiful. And so in this video, we will look at the different parts of the flower and we'll focus more on something called unisexual and bisexual flowers and look at some of their examples. So let's get rid of that and focus on the flower. The flower can be broadly divided into four parts. This middle part that you find over here, we call it the carpel. You can also call it pistil. Now it turns out that carpel and pistil are not exactly the same, they have some differences, but that difference is only important when we deal with more complicated carpels. But as of now, we can just call them, in, for such simple flowers, we can just call them the same thing. So you call them carpel or pistil, doesn't matter. But what's important is that the carpel or the pistil, that is the female reproductive part of the flower. So I'm just gonna call this the female reproductive part. I'm just gonna write female reproductive. Okay? Now why do we say that the carpel is the female reproductive part? Because it is the carpel that is responsible in production of egg cells. Carpels make egg cells somewhere over here. And so just like how in animals, the female reproductive part makes the egg cells. So any part, any product, reproductive part which makes the egg cells is often called the female reproductive part. The next one would be stamen. So these are the stamen. We have four stamens in our flower. The stamen, they are the male reproductive parts. So let me write that over here. Oops, all right. So the stamen are the male reproductive part. Any guesses why it's called the male reproductive part? Well, because it is, it is where the sperm cells are made. Sperm cells. Again, just like in animals, the reproductive part that creates them sperm cells, we call them the male reproductive part. And the whole idea behind sexual reproduction is that the sperm cells need to go and fuse with the egg cells. But we'll have to wait for that action. It's gonna happen in the future videos. For now, let's only concentrate on the parts of the flower. So we are two down, two more to go. And yeah, before we proceed, one important thing, whenever I get confused between these names, Right, what I do is I remember stamen has the word men in it. And that's how I, that, that helps me to remember that stamen is the male reproductive part. Something to help me remember. All right, now let's go to the third one. The third one is probably the easiest one to remember. It's the petals. What do they do? Well, you know, they make the flower attractive. And so the main job is to attract, attract insects like bees and butterflies, even birds. Why? Because as we will see in the future, they play a huge role in, in the reproduction. Uh, you may have heard of this thing called as pollination, right? We'll talk about all of that fun stuff in the future videos, but the petal job is basically to attract the insects. And finally, that brings us to the fourth part, the sepals. The sepals played an important role in protecting this flower even before it blossomed. You might know that when the flower, before the flower blossoms, it's a bud, right? And so what's covering that bud? It's the sepals. It's a sepal that protects the things inside from maybe getting eaten or anything. So their main job of the sepal was to protect, let me just write that, was to protect, protect the young flower, I would say. The young, I would say the young bud. Of course, now that the flower has blossomed, its job is done, but nevertheless, it did play an important role in its life. So these are the four parts of the flower. And of course, in the future video, we'll dig a little deeper and look at the parts of the carpel and the stamen separately. But what I wanna tell you now is that in this particular example, we, have, we are seeing that both the female and the male reproductive parts are on the same flower. Right? Such flowers are called bisexual flowers. Why? 
because they have both the sexes on the same flower, bisexual. But in some cases, we will find they will only contain either the male reproductive part, the stamens, or they will only contain the female reproductive part, the carpels. In such cases, since they contain only one reproductive part, we will call them unisexual flowers. So let's take some examples. If you look at lilies, then they are bisexual. Why? Because if you look carefully, you can see the carpel, the female reproductive part, and you can see the stamens as well. These are the stamens, the male reproductive part. Both are present, so it's bisexual. Another famous example is hibiscus. If you look carefully, you can see this female reproductive part, the carpel. Of course, the carpel is a little complicated. You can see one, two, three, four, five carpels fused together. So it's a little complicated, but what's important is that you see the female reproductive part, and you also see the stamens over here. These are all the stamens, the male reproductive part. Because both are present, this is a bisexual flower. On the other hand, if you look at papaya flowers, if you look at the top flower, what you're seeing are only the carpels. Of course, there are five carpels over here, but only the female reproductive part is present, only one sex. Therefore, this is a unisexual flower. And since only female reproductive parts are present, we will call that as the female flower. On the bottom, we have another papaya flower itself, but this one only contains the stamens, the male reproductive part. And therefore, this one will be a unisexual male papaya flower. Now at this point you might say, that's great, I understand unisexual and bisexual flowers, but here's the problem for exams. In exams, they ask us to list out the flowers which are unisexual and which are bisexual. How do we do that? How do we remember which flowers are unisexual and bisexual? Here's what I do. So whenever I say the word flower, whichever flowers come to your mind, most of the famous flowers that you might know of, like sunflowers, lilies, hibiscus, lotus, daffodils, tulips, roses, marigold, whichever famous flower you can think of, those are all bisexual flowers. That's a clue to remember bisexual flowers, the most famous flowers you can think of, all right? On the other hand, when I talk about big fruits or big vegetables, think big fruits, big vegetables, like papaya or jackfruit or watermelon or, or pumpkin, bottle gourd, so big vegetables and big fruits, turns out their flowers are usually unisexual. Now of course, if there is no rule like that, this is just a way to remember. For example, if you take mango, which, is, which can also be big, right? Turns out mango flowers are bisexual. So don't think of it as a rule, it's just a way to remember unisexual and bisexual flowers, especially for our exams, okay? That's pretty much it. So to quickly summarize, what did we see in this video? We learned the four parts of the flower, and then we saw that if both the carpel and the stamen are present on the same flower, both the sexes are present on the same flower, we will call them bisexual flowers. And how do we remember it? Well, the most famous flowers you can think of, they're all bisexual. And if you have only one of the sexes present on the flower, either just the carpels or only the stamens, then we will call them unisexual flowers. And how do we remember it? Remember big fruits and big vegetables. Not all of them, but mo like papaya, jackfruit, pumpkin, their flowers tend to be unisexual.